Hello. Hi. Beautiful Sunday morning. I'm again connected to New Zealand. With a beautiful lady, which I met a few days ago. And when we started talking, the short conversation became three hours long. And I am so honored that you are giving me your precious time Sunday again with me and uh, agree to share your experience, your perspective, how you see the world for our community on the Facebook, Hatawani and YouTube. So welcome you again. And uh, I always ask uh, to introduce the guests. Okay, May I ask my name is Hayes Silksberger. Uh, I'm of Māori, French, Irish, and English, and mm -hmm. Aboriginal Australian descent. And I'm a painter and sculptor. How was your journey? Difficult. Sometimes Why? difficult um, because I didn't have the skills at the beginning to um, to know how to do anything, uh, especially as a child and a teenager. So I didn't allow myself to express um, myself in any art form other than dancing as a child everywhere that I possibly could, you know, um, in the woods, you know, in nature, around my family. And then writing, I started writing about 15 years ago oh. as a form of expression because I felt a lot of, um, I had a lot of questions I needed to answer about society and behavior and it was writing and painting that helped me to come to a conclusion I guess mostly about myself and what I see out in the world. Mm. What about it was the writing? Uh, the writing and did, was about... Did anybody to read it? Yes. I did. Uh, I gave it to a um, director of plays in Wellington. His name was Barry Lakeman, I think. He has since passed away after um, knowing him for a, a very short six months. But he gave me a lot of advice. Um, a friend of mine introduced us and told him that I'd written a script, uh, a play. And he asked me, so you've written a play? And I said, um, no, I just wrote a story. I don't know how to write plays. And he was like, tell me about your play. So within five minutes of starting the story, he stopped me and said, wow, I just have to stop you for a sec because you definitely have a script. You definitely have a play. It contains everything a great play should have. You know, you pulled me in in the first few minutes. You threw me aside wow. and I was heartbroken and you made me cry you made me laugh you said it's everything a good play needs continue so two hours later i've completed the story and he wanted to produce it uh, you know i have to admit that you sent me a short poem called the colonizator and uh, 
I was really taken away. I couldn't even listen. I was trying to start again and again. And after a couple of words, I was like always like, oh, it is <laughs> hard, it is so deep, it is simple, but it is so deep, it is touching so much that you start living, you know, the, the heart of somebody who was colonized. It is, it well, is I wrote it. Um, I wrote it because I'm viewed on the outside as a Māori woman. You know, this is what I'm told. I look Māori, but I don't understand that perception because to me, I just look like myself and that I'm human. You know, that's the biggest part for me. So, I sent you a screen in, in order it will help you to comment about your childhood. And also we agreed to talk a little bit about the Maori culture, how it came into your mm -hmm. life, how it became that you are one of them. Or yep. partly. Do you see the screen? The, yes, I can. This is me at four years old. Mm -hmm. And... Do you want me to go further? Yeah. This is my great great grandmother. Mm. Uh, she was a Māori woman, and she was her mother was captured during a battle, and the man who captured her then made her his wife. Um, so this is their daughter. They had two daughters. Her name is Irina Parerokawa. And she married a Frenchman who migrated to New Zealand in 1845. And he only learnt to speak Māori language and French, you know, which was his national language. They didn't speak English. They only conversed between the two languages, as did their children. This is... These are my aunts and uncles and my brothers and sisters. And I'm the little girl on the right of the screen in the very front with wearing a, a white dress uh, that looks like a white dress. So that's me. Um, I think it may be six. And those are my uncles in the background, all of my aunts in the center and two of my siblings in the front and one sibling directly behind me, well, two siblings di directly behind me. So that's taken at my grandparents' home. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's you. That's me. Yeah. These are my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather is from the Frenchman and the Maori woman. And my grandmother here is from um, an Aboriginal half-caste mother and Māori father. Oh, sorry, half-caste. Um, my grandmother's mother is a Māori woman and her grandfather is an Aboriginal tracker that was taken to New Zealand in the 1800s to track... Um, for the government and then when their work was done they were abandoned and left behind mm. so that's why he settled with a Māori family this is part of my whakapapa which is my lineage um, in Europe you would call that your family tree so we uh, connect from the oldest living um, entity or element on earth as a human being we start with our mountain and then we go down to the body of water that carried our ancestors to our ancestral house uh, this is in inside of one of my ancestral houses um, I come from three different tribes and this is one of the tribes um, the ancestral house that I come from from my grandmother's side of the family wow that's very 
very different. This is where my grandfather grew up. Um, this is his ancestral house, <clears throat> where those mountains and that, that lake was, that's where he's from. We have these and this is in different cultures. Pardon? We have different in this, like you know, in Chinese culture, in my culture, Lithuanian, in European, in different cultures, we have these centers. What does it mean in Maori culture? Oh, it's um, it's called the kuaha, which is a gateway mm -hmm. um, or a doorway, and all the carvings represent ancestors. So my grandfather used to repair these carvings um, throughout his lifetime. Okay. I stop sharing now, by now. And coming back. So we have seen where are you from? And now you, in the beginning you told you don't say like you are Maori or you are French, you are all in you. How started for you the journey to discover who are you really? Um, the beginning was lessons about genocide during World War II um, with Germany, you know, killing all of the Jews or as many Jews as they did. My mother, uh, her father died in Tunisia, in the north of Africa, during World War II, and she was three years old. So that affected her deeply, losing her father to war. So her beliefs were that you shouldn't go to war, you shouldn't kill another human being. And so her lessons were to teach us how important life is. and. Um, I guess the lessons about slavery, racism, and genocide were a huge part of my childhood, like for many, many years. So, you know, the songs that I learned to sing were to Martin Luther King's We Shall Not Be, you know, um, and Pete Seeger's songs, We Have All the Flowers Gone, which is a song about all the soldiers. Um, that was my, you know, childhood and I grew up understanding that I would, could describe myself as a human being, that I was free thinking, an individual and that I could form my own ideas of myself and of others. But to recognize difference and to accept difference so, you know, that's been the premise behind my, my whole life is to accept others for who they are. So the description Māori never came into um, my childhood until I was 12 years old and then told by my best friend that I was dirty. I'm a dirty Māori, yes. um, which is a word I'd never heard before. And, you know, I went home and asked my mother, what is that? And she just tried to describe it to me without using the words uh, race or colour. Mm -hmm. um, so she just said, well, your grandfathers come from Europe. Some people call them Europeans. And your grandfathers come from here. And people here call them Māori. And I remember looking at my grandmother and thinking, but how do people know she is Māori? How do people know that I... Because I could not differentiate between my, my skin, my mother's skin, and my grandmother's skin. And we were all different shades. Um, and then I didn't think about it until it came up again as an adult. And I realised that I was feeling the effects of racism. But I also realised somewhere in there I had been colonised, but I hadn't recognised it personally. Mm -hmm. I could see it, but I didn't feel it. 
Yeah. And how it is, you know, in you, you are colonized and you are the colonizer. That's right. <laughs> because now I have colonized the English and now their uh, ancestors, oh, sorry, their descendants look like me. Yeah. It is Which I think is lovely. It is interesting experience uh, how to be it. So how was your journey? Because you, I guess you, you grow up quite a uh, European style and just in some uh, moments of, on your life, when you met some people, you have been made aware that you are not, uh, not completely, you have also another cultural background. Uh, I never grew up believe, uh, thinking that I was European. Um, I grew up only believing that I'm human. And that's my only connection to others. Uh, so I grew up with my grandparents first, uh, before my grandfather passed away, um, and grew up within the fold of a very tight nuclear family. You know, my, when my grandfather died, my father supported my grandmother. He supported his younger siblings, um, helped to educate them and feed them. And also, we grew up in a very isolated tiny community which was really only for my father's job it was in the middle of a native bush it was a mill and they were milling the last of the native trees mm -hmm. and then replanting with pine trees so that was my landscape running amongst native bush and my father was a wild food gatherer so I'd never seen um, meat in a supermarket. I'd never been into a supermarket until I was 12. Mm -hmm. And I didn't recognize a lot of the things because I'd never grown up with them. You know, my parents gathered everything or they grew it. And most of it was traditional foods, um, which I've since learned are now gourmet. Yeah. Just behind uh, your back, you have one of your paintings. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Painting became also one of the ways to express yourself, to express your pain and your perspective, how you see the world, how it happened, how it came to your life, painting. Um, painting was something I started at as young as um, kindergarten, which would have been about three years old. And I used to paint with my fingers. And all I remember is loving the feeling of it. But growing up and believing that I couldn't express myself in drawing on paper or in paint the way that I wanted to, um, I just wouldn't allow myself to do it because I knew I didn't have the skills as a child to express what I wanted to. And I'd I knew it didn't look like what everybody else in my class was doing. So I just didn't allow myself. Um, painting about 14 years ago came about because I needed to express myself and to ask myself questions about society, mostly because I could see contradictions within society, within the systems, you know, the political systems. And I felt frustrated by it. And I needed a voice, my own personal voice. And these paintings are the beginning of it. We have, we see now, I, I started sharing already the screen with the first of your paintings. And uh, can you a little bit comment what it is about? We see the face, we have different, we see also uh, different colors. Well, this is about Papa, about lineage. It's about, creation and how you know god created woman from the earth and how he gave his breath um, through another i guess his godlike child um, how he gave it through him to give her life so it's about my descent from my mountain which is around my face because this is painted from my body i modeled these myself and also one of my sons 
Um, it's me in the background, it's him in the foreground. Mm. And yeah, it's about my children, my, my mother, my grandmothers, my grandfathers, my sons, my grandsons. Um, it's the story pretty much of creation from me, but also from my ancestors. Let's go to the next one. This is about uh, finding the right path um, to realize and recognize that when you come from creation, you come from all parts of it. And instead of only viewing yourself as one part of it, why not view yourself as all of it? So all of these paintings have been cut into. I've sculpted into um, the foundation to show different levels of where we come from. Mm -hmm. So we're just not one thing. This yep. is about uh, the Earth Mother mm -hmm. and how she creates life. That you know, she's my child. She's my mother, my grandmother. Um, and just different depths of her, uh, diff different flows around her, you know. Um, this is my daughters and my bodies. We, I actually used my daughter's body for this painting as well as my own. Mm -hmm. This is my youngest daughter. Um, The premise behind all the paintings with my children was, I asked them a question. I said, where are you when you were a child next to me? And where are you now? So place yourself where you want to be and should and would have been. And so my youngest daughter said to me, this is where I felt I've always been, right in your lap you know, um, held by you, nurtured by you. But at the same time, it's a story of ancestors, um, of their transformation, of the, the female entity. The color red mm -hmm. and gold, does it have any special meaning? Yeah, the red represents um, my ancestors, the blood uh, that flows through me. And the gold, I believe, represents uh, my tribe. You know, I don't see myself as brown. I see myself as golden. Well, okay, because the golden, we have seen, we will see also later on, those two colors, they are quite often so what is about this painting? This painting is about um, the first grandchild. It's an ancestral painting. The first granddaughter, the first human uh, girl. And it's also um, modeled by my first granddaughter. And I wanted to show a connection to God um because i i don't see myself as a religious person i see myself more as a spiritually connected person and so this is the closest um to a godlike feeling that i could get and you know it's about freedom yeah it's about facing the past in order to walk to your future it's about growth it's about support uh, this represents for me movement um, the four winds and within maori culture there are you know four corners of the earth and so the dance for me is the only way that i could describe that feeling 
um, for me, the wind is my breath mm. and everyone else's breath. You know, I believe that what we speak goes around the world and you can create change merely by speaking and the wind will carry it. This is about being broken, um, but also about birth. It's about emerging, um, I guess, transforming. I think that we have aspects of ourselves that sometimes we can't see all of ourselves and we only see pieces. So this is about an eruption and coming out and being born and that, that the flow continues. Wow, I love it. You can't, uh, on the first glance, you cannot see what it is exactly, but it, it uh, transmits the feeling of, of love. And when you explain what does it mean for you to colors everything, it, it makes completely different sense as I have seen first time. Okay, let's go to the next one. That's also one of my favorites. Painting yeah, song. it's one of mine too. Um, it helped me to recognize the first part of my identity. Uh -huh. um, I live in Australia yeah. and Coming here, I felt completely alone. Even though I came with my, my husband and my children, I still felt completely disconnected from my own sense of um, country, which is New Zealand. And I wanted to describe who am I really? And I discovered that I am the tree. And so this is about my birth um, from nature in New Zealand, where I grew up within the bush with my parents. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the first step to my identity. This is a, one of my first paintings. Um, it was about my search for myself within a Māori context. Um, I had completed uh, studying Māori language and history about two years before this painting and it was me questioning um, why am I here and pretty much, you know, where am I going? Mm -hmm. So the colour of blue, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. What it does represent? I think it represents hope. Hope. Um, yeah. Okay. Good oh, this is uh, one of my very first real drawings. Um, this came out of absolute despair. And I needed um some way of translating how i felt and how i saw the world and myself and my children um and what that can feel like sometimes now we are going again back to the Maori this is a yeah this is a carving this is my first Oh, no. uh, jade carving uh, which is called Ponamu and the stone um, is from the South Island of New Zealand mm -hmm. it's called Inanga because of its translucency mm -hmm. and it, I carved this for my granddaughter um, it represents her, her family um, her mother her father and herself, as well as her brother. And um, pretty much, um, I don't know if you've ever seen a fern. Mm -hmm. uh, the New Zealand fern is based on 
uh, a fern frond and it curls, um, you know, from a, the stem it just curls around and around. So it's, it represents the family. It has a very strong, powerful energy getting out. It does. Um, Ponamu is uh, something that is uh, um, sacred. It's a gift. It's millions of years old. Um, and so we treasure it when we're given one because you can't buy one for yourself. It can only be gifted because it's so treasured. Wow. Okay. This is uh, my mountain. It's um, the first shot of mountains that you showed with the lake. That those mountains are opposite to this one, okay. and this is where the my father's ashes have been scattered at the very top in the center. Um, it's where I feel I'm from. You know, it's the closest to home that I could possibly be because this is where my grandfather is buried um, near this mountain and my brother, um, some of my aunts and cousins. So this is what I consider my home. Now we are already in another topic uh, which we wanted to speak about. It is the spirituality and you, spirituality in the Maori culture. Mm -hmm. And I guess this one of your works is also represents more the invisible world, the world of ancestors and spirits. Yes, it is. Um, this one came completely, you know, like I don't believe that I paint just from myself. I believe that spiritually my ancestors are with me and have definitely guided me through this process because I've really had no idea what I was going to create with each painting. They just happened um, as they were and yeah, pretty much I didn't draw any sketches because I don't draw, I feel. Um, pretty much I started painting and from the beginning into the end and if this is how it ends up, this is what it is. So this is about um, the sky father and the earth mother. And this part that you're showing is the earth mother and the blue part of the painting is the space between the heaven and the earth, which is Ranginui, the sky father, and Papa Tuanuku is the earth mother. And when they were separated by their children, uh, so that their children could come into the world of light, which is knowledge, their children had to turn their mother away from their father because her tears were forming the seas and I wondered how does she live and how does he live if they can't see each other and I realized oh but they can uh, within the reflection of the sea and the sky yeah I tried to change oh yeah no This is about uh, ancestors and birth. I painted this painting as my granddaughter was being born. I was in New Zealand and she was being born in Australia. And this is what I felt uh, was coming through as she was being born. This is uh, another of um, the places that my ancestors come from. And I came here to this place because my father had just passed away uh, two days before. And 
I felt closest to him when I was near this body of water. Um, so ancestrally, this is where some of my father's family come from. Let us talk a little bit more about uh, spirituality in our, mm -hmm. our culture. How it happened to you? Because I guess when you're a child, not, uh, not especially if you are born in a mixed family, the awareness about spirituality takes time till it comes. Um, I felt uh, since I was a small child that I've always been connected to my grandfather, even though he passed away when I was three years old. Um, I've always felt that he's never left me. He's always guiding me, leading me, um, hears me. And, you know, Within Māori culture, um, we don't believe that our loved ones leave us. Okay. That they always sit here. Mm -hmm. On the left on shoulder. shoulders. Yes. On both. And that they go, you know, they never leave us. They're there to support us. Um, my spiritual awareness has become stronger. And, and I guess it's because of having a knowledge of my Māori ancestry, um, Māori language, but also connecting all aspects of myself, my family and history and spirituality has made it stronger. So, you know, it's nothing for me to connect with uh, an ancestor, um, you know, I'll talk to my grandfather and ask his advice. And, and do you get the answer? Yeah, I do. And even from my parents and, you know, I guess for some people, um, it might not sound normal, but you know, what is normal? I believe that we're connected to all of nature that we're not separate. So for me to talk to the weather and talk to my parents and talk to my grandparents and great grandparents, that's normal for me. And when I hear them, it's not a mental illness, it's our connection. How it happened that you became aware that you can also heal? Uh, I think, well, I, I feel uh, that it came from my grandfather. Um, you know, my mother said my grandfather would lay his hands on us when we weren't well. And she said, I never had to take you to a doctor because your grandfather would just touch you and you'd be well. Mm -hmm. And when my grandfather was passing away, I was taken to him, to his side. And the strongest memory that I have of him is his touch is his eyes looking into my bones, into my marrow. Uh, that's how strong that memory has carried me from a small child throughout my life. And, yeah, I don't know how else to explain it. It's just that I've discovered um, that I have used the same touch with lots of people. Yeah. Uh, healed lots of people um, that I I don't consider myself the healer I just consider myself the channel that the healing comes through and I'm only following in the steps of my ancestors really mm -hmm. can you give an example how it happened or the strongest example wonder what we could call as a miracle um, a friend, there have been a few incidences, but a friend of mine um, I was talking to who lives in Nazareth in Israel, 
and she's a Jewish woman and she's a healer and that's what she does all of, you know and has done all of her life is healed others had healing gatherings and I met her and she said um, has someone made you cry and I was like um, yeah and she was like you know that God counts a woman's tears when she cries mm -hmm. so men have to be careful mm -hmm. And she said, you know, that I'm a healer. And I was like, no, you know, I hadn't even heard of the word except from my mother when my grandfather healed us. Um, the two, to me, were completely different at the time. And she had a very strong belief in me and believed that I had this immense power that I needed to use to heal others and I said to her, um, shouldn't I be taught, you know, or can I really do that? Because I don't know that I can. And she was like, you can do it, just do it. Mm -hmm. So I took what she said and just pretty much, okay, I believe you. Um, I'll see what happens. So she asked me about a year later, we were on the phone together and she disappeared off the phone and pretty much to the point where I thought something horrific had happened to her. A few days later, um, she called me and said that she was in hospital and that she was blind. Uh, she was about to undergo an operation within 24 hours um, to find out what the cause of her blindness was. And she said, before I have the operation, will you heal me? because I don't want to be operated on. I want you to heal me. And I said to her, oh, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. And she said, you can, so just do it. So I believed her. And I asked my son to help me to send her healing and to uh, take her wherever he takes people for spiritual healing and that I would do the same. And when she contacted me, she said that she wanted to know every detail of what we did. And so I just described to her that I, um, well, actually my son described to her first that he took her to his spiritual place and placed her within a pool and then put flowers around her and over her and just let go of her so that she just floated. And this was in a cave with light shining through the top, like a little bit of sun coming through the cave. Mm. And I just removed, thought about, you know, meditated on removing her pain. Mm. And she said, how did you do that? And I said, well, I didn't really do anything. I just could see colours vibrating in, and away from me. And the colours were red, blue and white. So then she explained that she left the hospital uh, the same day that she'd asked us to heal her. She went without her doctor's permission. She had to sign a waiver that she took full responsibility for herself. Her husband took her in a wheelchair, placed her in a taxi, and she said, I'm going by myself. She told the taxi driver to take her to the Sea of Galilee. And on the way, she asked the driver to stop at a flower store because she felt that she had to buy flowers for her father's grave. And she asked him first to choose blue flowers, uh, sorry, red flowers. And then she changed her mind and said, no, blue flowers. And then she changed her mind again and said, no, um, they have to be white, white flowers. And so the driver got the flowers, took her down to her father, um, where her father's buried in the cemetery near the Sea of Galilee and then went down into the sea and pretty much um, just walked straight in and lay down. 
and she said when she stood up, her blindness was gone. Wow. And then she asked my son, what flowers did you put around me? And he said, lilies, white li lilies. And she laughed and she said, those are the flowers that I bought. And she said, you, you healed me. And I just took it as a given. I believed that she believed in me and my son and I believed it that we could do that uh, without question, without our egos. Uh, it was just something that we felt we could do in that moment. Another time was when she called me uh, during the bombings between Palestine and Israel, which would have been somewhere around 2006, I think it was 2006 and or maybe 2005 no 2006 and 7 there was a lot of bombing between israel and um palestine and she asked me to give them peace she said the bombings had gone on for too long and she wanted the the people to have peace and so i said okay I went to my Māori language and history class and talked to my peers and said, you know, Inbal has asked us to ask for peace for her country and for Palestine at this time. Um, would you all join me and bring peace to both countries? And um, so what they did. We joined in a prayer and pretty much uh, that evening she called me and she said, you see, you did it. The bombings have stopped. We have peace for the first time. Wow. Um, so I don't, you know, say to people, I can heal you mm -hmm. or, you know, um, I'm a spiritual healer. I don't think it's something that I need to advertise. Um, if somebody needs healing and I feel that I can do something to help them, then I just ask them, you know, um, would you like me to help you? And most of the time, they, well, pretty much all of the time, they say yes. And they're surprised. Um, by the feeling that they experience. Yeah. Um, we have a healing touch that is called midi midi and within Māori culture and it's um, a very spiritual connection, uh, a very deep connection and it's also recognising um, everything that has come before and what is happening now. And so pretty much for me, it's the same touch that my grandfather gave me. Mm. Exactly your, the same. Your extraordinary capacity to, to channel the energy and uh, power to heal people, to speak with their nature. Do you think where it comes from, it is anxious from your ancestors, as you mentioned, from your, from your grandfather? I think it's more than that. I think it started with him and with the, um, the Jewish woman. Mm -hmm. She opened me up to using it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's because I've always can't say used my intuition. I just have this inner knowledge that I know things and I don't know where they came from, but I know they didn't come from a book and from others. You know, nobody taught me anything. It's just a, 
an inner knowledge that just comes from the center of me. And I think that belief is because I feel so connected to everything. And that's why I cannot identify myself um, as being a certain culture from a certain group of people. Uh, for me, that's a disconnection of part of myself. So I can only recognize myself as a spiritual human being who's connected to all of nature, all of the universe, that I am one with it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I prefer to be called and identified as. And that and in this way, I'm not disconnecting from my true self. You have a miraculous touch with your paintings, with your words, also by healing. And the poetry you sent to me, as I told, it is very, very powerful. Are you may maybe ready to read it here? Yep, I can do that. Um, sorry, I just have to bring it up on my um, yeah. laptop. I won't be a sec. It's pretty easy to find. I went through a stage of um, writing well, from, because I couldn't define whether I write as a poet or if I'm just, if I'm writing prose, um, to me the two things aren't really a description of what I'm doing because it's no different to healing, it's no different to painting, you know. It, it's a voice that's inside of me that just has to come out. And this was the form that it came out in. I um, hope you don't mind if I just look away from the camera for a yes, sec. Sure, sure. It's called Colonizer. Colonizer, colonizer. What was it like in England? Who told you to come? Did someone twist your arm? Were you tired offered? Do you remember that life? Is it lingering in the flow of your children? What did it take for you to gather your belongings? Did you have any? Colonizer, colonizer, why did you come? Was it despair? Did they not care for you when they took your life to send it so far away? How did you sleep, dreamer? What did you dream? Land as far as you can see it. Sorry, land, can you see it? As far as the eye lying to you? As much as you can hold as it slips closer away from you? I know it was an opportunity to live, to eat, to have. Oh, colonizer, how did you see me with eyes filled only with land? What does that feel like? When you heard my cries, did it make you cry too? Did you laugh? Or is that a look of confusion? When I spoke, did you see my words as they tried to run away from you? What did we see in you? Is your rope really that attractive? I know, we pulled ourselves up with it. Did my hand get tied into it? Is that why I couldn't escape you? Where do I go? To the sea? To drown my sorrow? To the tree where I took my first breath? Do I bury myself in my mother? Will she keep me warm without her cloak? Did I forget to weave one? Colonizer in the name of queen and country womanizer. What did my mother's face look like when you lay on her? Did she protest as your cat? X cut away her cloak? Was there a murmur? Did you hear her whisper? A 
as your spade dug into her? When will you release her? Resourceful, that's what she is for you. She has so much to offer. Take as much as you need. How much do you need? Did you give her your koha or did you forget to offer? Ah, yes, yes, I, I see it now. Your koha flows in our mother's blood on her children. It's called progress. Is there sorrow in your gift? Colonizer, colonizer, do you see them, my ancestors? What did their tears say to you when they fell from their lips? Yes, you worked hard for what you have. What is it again, this thing you have? Ah, oh, yes, your koha flows down to your house, the one you built by the edge of my father's tears. Colonizer, why do you turn away? I welcomed you with open arms. I gave you my daughters. I opened the door for you. They sleep by your side. Your reflection is now mine. She sleeps in my arms, protected by me. As my lips fall onto her cheek, her tears, sorry, my tears, whisper her name, colonized. Mm. Wow, it is very, very powerful. Um, I think it is very important to speak it out, to speak out the pain, which was uh, hidden and secret many, many years. You know, it's mostly about me questioning my identity still. You know, um, I thought that going, sorry, I thought that going to study Māori history and Māori language would help me to identify myself, but it didn't. It made me extremely sad. Wow. Um, yeah, for me, it was one of those contradictions. Yes, here's the history, here's the knowledge, here are all the tools to tell you and help you to identify yourself. But I felt sad because I couldn't. I still couldn't find that answer within myself. So writing this, these words was me searching and asking the questions to those who came to Aotearoa and to try and have an understanding of them and what they must have felt and what they were searching for and how do they now identify themselves. And by opening the door and welcoming them, which is what you do traditionally, you call your visitors to you to bring them into your home, you feed and nurture them, in every way that you possibly could. Yeah. And so I had hoped to find the answers for myself and I recognized the answer was in my granddaughter who had just been born. Yeah. What is so, for you, Shaman? What is for you in your life? What does it mean the word Shaman and Shamanism? And do you consider yourself as one of them? I think I do. Um, for me, it's a bigger description of being connected spiritually to the land, your ancestors, to nature, to God mm -hmm. and the gods. Um, yeah. I can't really explain it because it's just something that I feel that, you know, it's that knowledge and knowing um, that I can journey, mm -hmm. that I do speak with the ancestors. Um, yeah, pretty much it just helps me to describe myself better. Uh, on yeah. this earth. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Regarding today, you have been searching for your identity, but in the search, you're also helping your other people 
from Maori culture to find, to identify themselves and to speak their truth, to speak uh, the suffering they have been experiencing since generations which was not spoken. Uh, and also today you have another activity. You are curator of exhibition. Can you tell a little bit more about it? Um, I'm a, going to be a part of an exhibition in it's the center of Poland, in a city called Torak, um, in their contemporary, the city's contemporary art gallery in Poland. Um, it's supposed to be happening next year, and hopefully it still is, um, but with the COVID virus, um, I have no idea of the time frame. So, I've been invited as one of eight Māori artists because I'm contemporary. Mm -hmm. I don't follow in the traditions of my ancestors um, by creating images um, or works of art that specifically look the same as my ancestors' work. Uh, for me, it's about a, describing myself uh, now and um, my life really and my spirituality so yeah pretty much the work is based on identity and what is Māori culture um, I was having a huge like mental block for the last three years working on this idea because as soon as someone says, who are you as a Māori? Tell me about your culture. I start to question myself all over again. And then research, research, research. Um, what is identity? What is culture? What is language? And always come back to spirituality that that's a better description of my identity and that growing up within my family and my grandparents and extended family within nature living from nature is a better description of myself and I had an epiphany uh, just recently because I was thinking about one of the artworks that I was creating and how do I tell this story which is really about myself. And I realized my culture is not what everyone would expect me to say. I've discovered my culture is only the journey that brought me here. That's a beautiful summary of what you have in saying and who you are and about your work. How people can reach to you out? Um, you can just contact me directly at, um, on Facebook. Um, under Kobe Salty Burger, mm -hmm. and Kobe is actually my husband. Mm -hmm. He was given the name Kobe by the Jewish healer, the Israeli woman. Uh, she couldn't pronounce his German name, which is Kurt, and she said, "Can I please give you another name? And can it be Kobe?" It's short for Jacob wow. because of Jacob and Rachel in the Bible mm -hmm. and how long Jacob had waited all of his life for Rachel. And the, my friend um, believed that my husband waited for me always and never complains and is extremely patient just like Jacob was. So that's why 
we're both under Kobe Salty Burger. Uh, Salzburger is our surname, my husband's name. Um, but yeah, Salty Burger comes from our youngest son who likes to, you know, play with words. Mm. Um, or you could get me my email, which is Casadani at gmail.com. It's small. Um, we can post later in the comments. So yeah. and then people can reach you out. Thank you so much for your beautiful conversation, for your amazing journey you shared with us today. I wish all the best for your work, for your exhibitions, and uh, for your writings, Thank for you. your poems, and also for your beautiful journey as healer, as shaman. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak and to talk about my perspective. And I'm here to Kia Koto Kato.